Today's panelists are Tim Madden and Michael Bodie. Tim is the senior CAM engineer at Royal Circuit. He has been involved in the manufacturing and design of circuit boards for 25 years, working for a variety of companies. He's been with Royal Circuit for over three years. Michael is a product specialist at Polar Instruments. Fast tracking from his BS in civil engineering in 2012, Michael now specializes in stack up design tools, controlled impedance, and TDRs for impedance testing. A popular speaker, he has spoken at PCB conferences across the US and Europe, and his cross discipline migration brings a fresh insight into the challenges of designer fabricator communication. So now I'll go ahead and turn it over to Tim. Thanks, Lisa. My philosophy has always been the design should dictate the stack up and not the other way around. You need to be aware of the limits of what can be done, but adjusting the stack to meet the design is usually the easier way to do it. Often we get people asking for what the trace and space should be for a differential pair or other impedance requirements with our standard stack up. This will result in a very small trace and, and spacing between the traces, meaning a lower yield and higher cost. When getting the layers closer together with wider traces and increased spacing between those traces would dramatically improve the shield. If you want to make sure the design is buildable, just send it to us as early as possible. All we need to know is the number of layers, the copper thickness on each layer, the total thickness of the board, and any impedance requirements, including what layers the structures are on and what the trace width and the spacing for the differential pairs are. So what are we talking about when we're dealing with stack-ups here? The stack-up is defining how the PCB is put together with layer count, the distance between the layers, and the material used. This should be specified all by the engineer and provided in the fabrication package. If the layer-to-layer -layer spacing is not critical for design, then it is not to be called out, and the manufacturer will adjust the uh, whatever we have on, on hand and to meet the requirements of the board. We won't, you know, we'll still, we'll still come to as a balanced design, though. The question on who does the stack is a fair one, and there are advantages and disadvantages to both. The obvious one is the manufacturer, that we will do the, the full stack up. We do it every day. We're familiar with the tools and the procedures. I'll probably do an average of 10 stacks a day for both potential uh, designs as well as existing ones ready to be manufactured. We also know what materials are available and then can build the stack to what's uh, what we have immediately on hand. The drawback for this is uh, when you're dealing with impedance calculations, the different tools can give slightly different results. You'll still get uh, a board that will meet your impedance requirements, but how it's gotten there might be a little bit differently. People will also use different dielectric constants or numbers in there, which will result in slightly different materials being used for the board. The other possibility is the engineer or the PCB designer doing it. This provides the greatest consistency between revisions and CMs. The drawback then is they don't know what material is available, and then if they call something out, the manufacturer might not have it readily available. This can cause delays in procuring the design. What the circuit designer and the manufacturer consider a stack up are slightly different. For an engineer, electrical consideration like what nets are on what layers and the purpose of each layer. They probably care about the distance between the layers but not care how that spacing is actually accomplished. But, you know, and they'll also care about the usual material properties. And then as you know, the slide shows, they'll care about the, you know, what are the high speed shielding layers, etc. For the manufacturers, we are worried about exactly what and how much material is used within the stack. So while the engineer might only call out for 10 thousandths between layers one and two, we know that there'll be three pieces of 2113 uh, 
that is used for achieving that. We're not worried about the electrical consideration. or the exact purposes of it. We do consider cop copper coverage on each layer for things like resin starvation and potential warpage of the board, as well as what type of construction we're going to do with it, whether it's going to be foil or cap. We'll de I'll define those in a minute here. There are some limitations that you need to be aware of when you're figuring out for your stack up. 0 0.003 layer to layer spacing is the standard minimum that we want to deal with. Most laminates have breakdown voltage of around 1,000 volts per mil of thickness. And 3 mils we discovered is what will really ensure uh, no chance of layer to layer shorts. There is 2 mil material available, but that is for some very specific readings like uh, embedded capacitance and should only be used on the for really specific reasons and consulting with your uh, manufacturer. The copper thickness, when you're dealing with a four layer board, you really can almost throw it away as a, a consideration when uh, you're worried about the total thickness because it's, uh, each layer might have one mil of copper on it, but when you get up over eight or more layers, then that copper really starts to add up and you have to consider it for the board. You also want to balance stack up to prevent warping, and by balance I mean that the board is mirrored within itself. So the distance between one and two and the bottom and the layer above that are the exact same. Materials is one of the most important decisions you have to make with regards to performance and cost. You need to know exactly what factors are the most critical for your given design. This is a very full topic in itself, so here's a really brief description that we use at Royal Circus regularly. Standard FR4, we use high temperature that is good for any uh, lead-free application. It's got a dielectric constant of about 4.2. If you look up data sheets, they give provide a range. 4.2 is the number that we use for our beans calculations. FR408 is another flavor of FR4. There's a low dielectric constant of 3.8. We also really use polyimid for high temperature applications, as well as Rogers material for high frequency boards that also has a low dielectric constant. Data sheets for all these can be provided for any of the material you might be interested in, either by us or by going directly to the manufacturer's website. In your fabrication package, you will want to specify the minimum copper thickness. Ounces is the unit of measure usually used with one, in, one ounce being equal to about 1.4 mils of copper. The thinner the traces, or the, th the thinner the copper should be. Here I provided a cross section of what the traces look like after etch. You can see that the top of the trace is narrower than the bottom of the trace. This is because for the etching chemicals, they hit the top first and they etch their way down. So the top of the trace is exposed to those chemicals a lot longer and you wind up with the V-shape almost. So the thicker the uh, copper, the more extreme this is for the traces. If you have traces 5 mils or thinner, we usually recommend half ounce copper and certainly with 3 mil traces it must be on half ounce. With high power boards or ones that copper is used to move heat around, the thicker copper is often needed and in those cases, you also have the coming wider traces. Inner layer copper thickness also has a major impact on impedance structures on the inner layers. You can't freely switch between one ounce and half ounce without redoing all the calculations for any impedance structures you might have on those inner layers. We referred to two different types of stack ups earlier, the foil and the cap. Foil is what we standardly use and it's our preferred method. That is a piece of foil that is used for the outer layers, followed by prepreg and then core inner layers. Cap construction is where you use core for the outer layers so that one and two are on the same piece of material, then three and four with prepreg in between there. This is used when you're using Rogers material and is also when spacing is critical between the outers and the inner plane. 
because you can hold a much tighter tolerance with one piece of core material than you can with pre-break. Both these can be freely used and we prefer that not to be called out unless required within your design. So here's a stack up of a typical foil construction. The dark green at the top is what to be the solder mask. Then you've got a piece of foil followed by prepreg. And then two and three are on the same piece of core material, followed by more prepreg, four and five, and then prepreg and then foil at the bottom. This is also a good example of a balanced stack up where it's basically mirrored itself around the center. Um, these drawings are all done with the Polar software that uh, Michael will be talking about in a second. So cap construction for a same thickness of board, where one and two is on one piece of material, followed by prepreg, three and four on one piece of material, and then five and six on the bottom. As I said, foil is the standard for most uh, board manufacturers that we like to use but certainly cap construction is no problem to go between them. The last consideration on how boards are constructed is if there's blind and buried vias. This greatly adds to the complexity of the manufacturing process and can practically double the amount of process steps for the inner layers. These can either done be built with sequential lamination or with controlled depth drilling. Sequential lamination is where you build parts of the board separately, so if you've got line between one and six on a 12 layer board. You would build one through six together, drill that, and then put the rest of the board on it, and then drill the final one. So you will practically double the amount of process steps for an inner layer. That's why we always recommend you limit the number of layer sets as possible, so you don't have a situation of lines going between one and two, one and three, one and six, one and eight. If you can get just between the fewest number of sets as possible, they'll uh, reduce the number of process steps and save you a lot of money. Here's a stack up of a blind and buried job where you've got blind berries between one and three, as well as nine and ten, and then buried between four and eight. So you would build the buried four through eight, process each, in each layer separately, laminate together, drill them. Then you would either do one through three and the bottom section, drill that, and then paste them together, and then do the final drill. Or you would paste the blind uh, layer sequences at the bottom, and then you control depth down between those. So those are quickly the description of on, uh, how we do stack ups and some of the basic information. The tools that the uh, pictures were all done with Polar Software and I'm going to turn it over to Michael and he can now uh, talk about impedances and that. Okay, thanks Tim. Uh, yes, I'd like to shift the presentation a bit at this point and take a look at some of the tools related to stack up design and fabrication. So we're going to just take a minute and switch the presenter over to my screen. And we'll get going with that. Did it get over to you? Yeah. And there we go. OK. So the first thing that I'd like to talk about is controlled impedance modeling. Obviously, this is extremely important for stack ups with controlled impedance traces. And what you're looking at here is the Polar SI8000 field solver, which will very accurately calculate for you what the impedance is based on the parameters and the structure that you selected. One of the most common questions that we get from people is, do I have to actually use a field solver? Because the alternative is to use one of the widely available free calculators that use equations instead of actually plotting the fields. And Eric Bogatin, who is a, a well-known industry expert in this area, excuse me, he did a paper on this exact topic and he studied, well, how accurate are the IPC approximations and how accurate are field solvers? 
And as you can see, the equation-based approximations do give you uh, some degree of accuracy. It looks like the best is about 6%. But depending on the line widths and configurations, you can get up to 20 and 30%. So good for maybe educational purposes, but as far as fabricating a PCB, you are going to need to use a field solver. Now, there's nothing special about polars. Any field solver will get you the right answer. But uh, people have told us that ours is nice and easy to use. The next point that is very important for dealing with controlled impedance modeling is simple and effective communication. So here's an example of what the printout looks like for the FI-8000. You see all the dimensions clearly labeled. Uh, there's tolerances, the target, and the calculated impedance. The next aspect, which can be really nice when you're dealing with controlled impedance structures, is what if scenarios. So for example, if you know that you're trying to design a 100 ohm differential microstrip, you can use a field solver to help you with that, but you may want to play around with the line widths and the spacings to maintain that 100 ohms. So what I've done is I've created this graph on the bottom in SI8000, which shows all the various possibilities for a 100 ohm microstrip structure. And uh, I've just blown up a couple pictures here of 8.5 uh, mil width or 15 mil width, and you can see how the different fields are. Uh, propagating in those cases. Now the next tool, which is very much related to what we're talking about, is Polar Speed Stack. And this is a tool which completely documents and designs a stack up, including the materials, the controlled impedances, and the final and base thicknesses. And this can be very important not only for the fabricator, but also for the board designer to make sure that, well, as I put it, you want to get it right the first time. And what we've done in SpeedStack is we've created a mode of the software called Virtual Material Mode, which offers a way for designers to use the software without getting bogged down with the details of a database of materials and pressing algorithms and all those things that a fabricator will surely have to deal with. But the designer will just be able to say, hey, I want these dimensions, I want this number of layers, and I want to make these kinds of controlled impedance structures. Reduced errors, increased communication, obviously extremely important for stack ups. Here's a screenshot of the technical report which can be generated from SpeedStack. You'll see three sections which you can customize to show all sorts of data about the materials, the base thickness, process thickness, dielectric constant, etc. All the controlled impedance structures and the drills. Uh, this would be kind of the paper format of communicating stack data between uh, different people or between the designer and the fabricator. Another really important feature that you may want to look for in a stack of design tool is the ability to show how the stack changes as it's pressed. You'll see in this diagram a four-layer board before pressing on the left and after pressing on the right. And in this case, SpeedStack has determined how much of the prepregs will be pressed based on the amount of copper on the layers that they're pressed between, and also has applied some plating to that outer copper foil. The last thing I'd like to talk about with regards to stack up modeling is about the data transfer. And there is a file format called IPC2581, which may be of interest to some of you if you haven't already heard of it. IPC2581 is a file format which contains all of the data necessary to design and fabricate the stack. So this is really important because uh, right now it takes multiple Gerber files, stack files, build materials, netlist, all of those things in order to completely define the stack. Well, with this IPC2581 file, everything is in one single file. Now, particularly with regards to stack ups, which is what you're seeing here, an example of the, the code.
code for the stack up section. That can be really helpful when you're transferring stack data between programs. So for example, if you did the design in SpeedStack and you wanted to import that into a layout tool, you can use this format to then transfer between your programs. And then finally, you can send your entire PCB design from a designer to a fabricator using this format. Here's a screenshot of the current IPC2581 consortium members. A couple big names which you may notice, Cisco, Ericsson, Fujitsu, lots of other ones, OEMs, uh, board shops, and software vendors. Uh, so there are a lot of people taking interest in this. And if you are looking for more information, I would encourage you to check out this website here, ipc2581.com, and see exactly what's going on with this format and if it could be useful for your particular application. OK, next, we are going to talk about coupons. Now, has anyone out there had to design an impedance coupon? Well, if you have, you may know that it can be time consuming, depending on how you do it and error prone. So what I'm going to do is take this stack. We've got an eight layer stack here with four controlled impedance traces specified. And in just four clicks, click, 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 we can automatically generate the coupon with Polar CGen tool. You'll see there are a couple of various coupon styles. The one in the middle is having the test points uh, hot dog style, style along the coupon. Uh, but we can also change the configuration to put them in a horizontal position or a vertical position, as well as adjust for different kinds of probes. But a good coupon design is very important because you want to make sure that you're actually mimicking the board with your coupon. But also that these coupons take up space on your panels. So minimizing that space is going to save you money or save the fabricator money, which will in turn uh, save you money if you're uh, the customer. The last topic for the webinar today is TDR testing. Why TDR? Well, the simple answer is that fabricators need to know that they built what they think they built. And using a TDR is the easiest way to do that. Now, there are some other tools which can be used, like a VNA could be used. But a TDR is the easiest to use and uh, more durable than a VNA. And there are all sorts of reasons that you would want to use a TDR to actually test the impedance of these traces. Now, there could be a whole webinar just on TDRs, but I'm just going to point out a couple of measurement techniques which are newer, which may be of interest to you. The first one is launch point extrapolation. This is a measurement technique which is just now being validated by the IPC committee. And it's a technique to calculate what the impedance is at the beginning of the trace, right at the launch point. And that is kind of tough to do because there is an, a discontinuity right there between the probe tip and the start of the trace. So you'll see on this waveform, at the far left side, there's actually a dip in some uh, things that don't look so good. So it's hard to actually take the measurement there. But some fabricators and designers are looking specifically to what is that impedance right at that launch point. So this is a technique to calculate what that is based on a line fit of a good part of that impedance waveform. And the last thing I'd like to show you today is loss testing. This is another application for TDRs. And it's picking up more speed in fabrication facilities. And insertion loss is something that is becoming more important as the speeds go up on the signals. A couple of applications which would be certainly concerned with insertion loss would be like server backplanes, where they're sending signals across very long transmission lines, let's say like a 24-inch transmission line they would be very concerned about how much of that signal is being lost and will the receiver be able to get enough of that signal. Another application would be like mobile phones where they are trying to keep their battery life as good as possible 
And to do that, they decrease the power on all these signals or the amplitude of these signals. So then they need to be very concerned with, well, how much of the signal is being lost as we send it over these transmission lines? So what you're looking at here And this is software that interfaces with the Tektronix scope to measure insertion loss using a couple of different standards. There's the set dill standard by Intel and an SPP standard by IBM. And typically what happens is you'll take the measurement over this frequency range and have a couple checkpoints. Like right here, they have a checkpoint at 4 gigahertz and 8 gigahertz. And they'll have a maximum amount of insertion loss at those points. Okay, that's it. And uh, at this point, we'd like to say thank you, everyone, for listening. And we're going to open it up for questions. If you didn't have a chance to yet submit questions, you can type them into the chat box. And I'm going to now turn it over to Tim to address questions. I don't see any questions coming in. Uh, I would like to add that for stuff that Michael just showed us, uh, we use that routinely at uh, Royal Circuits, uh, both the coupon generator as well as all the different uh, the stack up tools and the SI9000. Discover we can get some very good readings from there and get a good representation of the board that way. You can test the coupons easier than you can obviously a board because the traces usually aren't long enough and so you can design it very nicely on the board. Tim, I have a couple of questions for you, actually, while people okay. are working on the questions of their own. And the first one is, what is the biggest issue that arises for you as far as the stack up that you're receiving from a board designer? What's the biggest thing or the most common thing that comes up that you have to deal with? Uh, usually, if especially when they go between revisions, uh, that they will have a given stack up from a previous design and then call out all these and then copy and paste the impedances onto that uh, particular fab drawing and then those impedances, those trace widths that they're calling out for are not on the actual board. We'll still test for them, but it does cause great confusion if you don't, if you're calling out for trace widths that then aren't even there. Uh, the other problem that we'll occasionally have is how people call out their uh, impedances. The best way is, is we're just dealing usually with the Gerber files and so they'll call out different nets or provide pictures of okay this trace and then we have to go hunting and pecking to find okay what's that trace width. So calling out by trace and uh, spacing for differential pairs is the best way for us to uh, then model the stack up and then create the coupons to uh, make it board rather than us trying to figure out where the uh, impedance traces are on within the board. Okay, okay, thank you. Uh, actually, I had another question too. Um, Le before I get into that, uh, Lisa, I, I put something into the chat box and I'm not seeing it over here. I'm not sure if people's questions are, are getting to Tim and I. Are you getting anything? I have not received anything. Oh, okay. All right. Well, Tim, another question. You mentioned that uh, foil builds is preferred by Royal Circuits, and you said generally preferred. And could you explain to everyone why it is that that's the preferred build type? Uh, I think it's just the most cost-effective, and it gives us the most freedom within the uh, for creating the uh, the stack. Um, the the cap is certainly possible, but then you're also dealing with uh, potentially mixed copper weights. Usually you got one ounce inners and then wanting to start the outer layer on half ounce. This way you're just starting on half ounce foil copper and then you've got all one ounce on, on your inner layers. You know, it's okay. just as easier to, to keep everything uh, similar. Okay, and then the major, the major plus side to doing a cap construction is, is that what you said? You said you could actually get a very specific isolation distance. That's okay. that's the tightest tolerance that you're going to get is if you if you've got the material has a ten 